The characteristics and roles of air power continue to evolve along with a revolution in Australia's understanding of space power. In order to understand what this means for Australia's defence, Air Force has reviewed and revised our understanding of air power. Air Force has also taken on the lead for a new responsibility within Australian defence, that of space power, and examined what the role means both within a military context and from a national power perspective. The result is new guidance on air and space power. It's my great pleasure to invite Air Marshal Hupfeld, the Chief of Air Force, to launch the seventh edition of the Australian Air Power Manual and the first ever Australian Space Power Manual. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, all. Um, as I alluded to in uh, my opening address today, I am very proud to announce the publication of our seventh edition of the Air Power Manual and our very first edition of our Space Power Manual. Now, these manuals represent an evolution in our thinking about air and space power, moving away from service-centric uh, service roles and missions to properly situate them inside the enterprise of our nation and also within the community of like-minded nations. Reflecting on the Australian experience of air and space power, I don't think there's ever been a time uh, in our history where the unified purpose of the Australian Defence Force under one defence has been so strong. And I've certainly got uh, my colleagues that will join me today to, to thank for that as well. That is why uh, it's really important to make it clear to all, especially those more junior members in our virtual audience who collectively represent the future of air and space power, that I'm not only speaking to you today, as I mentioned this morning, not just as the Chief of Air Force, but I'm also speaking to you all as the air domain lead and the space domain lead for defence. Throughout my tenure as the Chief of Air Force, I've been impressing on our aviators the importance of expanding their expertise outside of the air and only the air and space domains to appreciate how those domains intersect with all the others in pursuit of common purpose. Now we cannot contribute fully to the joint force if our knowledge is limited to just one or two of the five operational domains, especially when they are all interwoven in the real environments in which we operate. Our integration as part of our joint force is already extensive, but one of the things that I want to impress upon you today is that the days of traditional thinking about Navy, Army and Air Force as the, um, significant independent arms, is, that, that, that notion is far gone. One of my goals as Chief of Air Force has, to be, has been to ensure aviators understand that our tradecraft, in terms of those capabilities, the effects those capabilities have on our environment, in constant with other Australian Defence Force and whole of government elements, along with those of our interagency partners and when in coalition with our allies and partners. The seventh edition of the Air Power Manual and the first edition of the Space Power Manual are intended to expand thinking about the future possibilities of air and space power from an Australian view, with a regional context and support the necessary development of air and space mindedness within defence. To summarise both manuals in a not so short sentence, air and space power contribute to joint effects as part of the military in uh, instrument of national power for the purpose of supporting whole of government efforts in support or and, and pursuit of national objectives. As our thinking about the application of air and space power has evolved, so has our thinking about how people best manage to engage the ideas that are, in, are articulated in these manuals. And that's why today I hold in my hand the um, seventh edition of the Air, and, of the air Power Manual, uh, and I think uh, your conference show bags should have one of these inside. Now, this is a physical copy of our Air Power Manual. Looks and feels like we'd come to expect, but its content has changed somewhat. But these are just limited to uh, a limited print of the manual, and we will uh, certainly have uh, some of those physically available here today. But hard copies are not going to be sent out in their thousands, as we may have done in the past uh, with previous editions. The Space Power Manual, however, is different, and its development did challenge our way of thinking with respect to the content, but critically, how we actually 
reach and educate our current and our future force. It has been so challenging, in fact, that it's reminded me of um, the Air Force motto, per ardua ad astra, through, stru uh, through struggle to the stars. Without challenges, however, there would be no reward. And I'm excited to say that we have produced an electronic manual, the E Space Power Manual, uh, with links to YouTube videos and online references. And that's aimed at the digital natives who serve now in our Australian Defence Force. These manuals can be amended as quickly as we evolve our thinking with changes to the strategic environment. For space power, this will be rapid as we accelerate our knowledge of the domain and we operationalise our space capabilities. Of course, the option to create physical copies uh, still exists. I'll probably have to do that myself. Uh, but alongside opportunities to be innovative with both manuals, to make them as attractive as possible to those who consume information in various different ways across all generations. The singular master version of the Air Power Manual and the Space Power Manual will both be hosted on the Air and Space Power Centre's website and they will remain living documents. They'll only ever be a few clicks away regardless of what, uh, what device you use to connect to the internet and our virtual audience can easily access them right now by simply searching for the Australian Air and Space Power Centre or typing the uh, address airpower.airforce.gov.au. I think they may have tried to put that up there for us. We want the content of these manuals to reach and educate the broadest possible audience as we recognise that the generation and continued renewal of resilient and relevant air and space power requires engagement across the entire enterprise of our nation and beyond. I encourage you all to actively engage with our Air and Space Power Centre to provide feedback on what works best for you to achieving that end. Both manuals outline the foundational properties of their respective operational domains. And for the air domain, this includes its ubiquity and the potential that holds, that holds for the application of military power, along with the human technology relationship that we need to unlock that potential. This is also true for the space domain, but the ubiquity of the space environment expands to be truly global in nature, at the ultimate high ground for activities both on and off the planet. While focusing on space, it's important to note that advancing defence's space power relies on a shift in thinking that moves us from being not just a consumer, but also a contributor, recognising that we are operating in an increasingly contested domain. Both manuals highlight the essentially human endeavour of air and space power and resist viewing this simply as a collection of platforms. We are aiming to create professional masters who are expert in air and space power practice and are skilled and adept in the collective outcome. While technologies and systems are important, they're not the only, they are only one part of what enables the delivery of military power. Without people intelligently wielding them, cutting edge technologies serve no real purpose. Both air and space power practitioners need to not only be technically adept, but they must also be, be strategically aware and understand their place in the joint force. And with that, understand their responsibilities to government. They must strive for professional mastery to maintain an intellectual edge. These manu manuals serve several nested aims. First and foremost, the manuals exist to support the training and education of those who will employ and enable air and space power. They also serve to situate military power within the Australian strategic context, highlighting that the generation and employment of air and space power is not an end in or of itself. Its purpose is to achieve national objectives. To achieve this, the manuals present the theory of air and space power, albeit at a high level, and notes the military power contributions model to explain the practical aspects of its employment. The contributions framework is designed to expand thinking on the possible application and utility of both air and space power. It aims to ensure that they, as a part of military power, are continually enhanced to best support national objectives. 
The contributions framework seeks to avoid arbitrary divisions and implied hierarchies. Rather, it's designed to promote the integration of air and space power capabilities with all other aspects of military and national power. The Australian government, like all governments, uses national power to pursue national objectives. We define national power as the total capability of a country to achieve its national objectives, devoid of external constraints and without being subject to coercion. National power is generated through a complex set of interdependencies among departments, agencies and organisations. National power can be described as having those well-known four principal instruments, diplomatic, information, military and economic. In the context of defence, air power is focused mainly on contributions to the military instrument. However, it can also provide support to the other three. For an example, humanitarian aid and disaster relief, uh, those sort of operations will use defence to support a nation affected by disaster while also helping shape Australia's diplomatic and economic interests. Space power can be different. Still focusing on contributions to the military instrument of national power, but with a much broader focus from the start across all instruments of national power. Space is critical to our way of life. Banking, navigation, weather, communication, and even our national broadband system. In that context, space is closely linked to our civil agencies and there are many continuous national missions, not just our military missions. Australia's military strategy as a component of national strategy describes the manner in which military power should be, should be developed and applied to achieve those national objectives. For the ADF, the Australian Government has outlined our military strategy through the three strategic defence objectives, and I mentioned those this morning. They are uh, shape, deter and respond. Deploy military power to shape Australia's strategic environment, deter actions against our interests, and when required, respond with credible military force. Pursuing these objectives requires more than simply providing a military response after the occurrence of an event that negatively impacts our national interests. These three overlapping and concurrent objectives require the military instrument of national power to be postured to continuously contribute to shaping, deterring and responding through a range of military activities. This also demands military activities be aligned and coordinated with the whole of government efforts. The concept of pursuing national objectives by creating outcomes through the employment of national power, including military power, this is not new, and war has long been considered the continuation of politics via other means. The instruments of, na have, uh, of national power have always been used in efforts to change an adversary's beliefs and behaviour, and of course we refer to those as effects. These effects concentrate on outcomes and how they may be achieved, the ends, rather than the mechanisms and the tools that enact them, the means or the ways and means. The military effects that support the pursuit of national objectives can be delivered from tasks in support of civil authorities through to the application of lethal force. They also come from any mix of capabilities from across all of the, all of the domains of the operating environment. While defence has divided up the operational uh, environment into domains, it is important to keep in mind that military operations themselves are conducted within a singular, unified environment. As has been talked about already today, uh, we call that the real world. Our world is indivisible, it's complex, and it's dynamic. It follows then that every operational environment is, comp is comprised of all of the domains interwoven and is inter interdependent with the information environment. While boundaries are drawn to allow the practicalities of resource apportionment, prioritisation and accountability, it must be recognised that these boundaries are self-defined and are therefore both malleable and porous. The ADF embraces a multi-domain approach to harmonise the contributions from each of the domains into the joint force, emphasising the importance of thinking laterally about the full range of capabilities available. Wherever possible, the ideal is to incorporate agencies, departments and domains into a single cohesive network. 
What is crucial to the utility of the multi-domain approach in defence is that they are practitioners with expertise in each domain, involved in designing and developing the military capabilities, along with planning and conducting military operations. These manuals, therefore, aim to ensure air and space power practitioners have the foundation on which to develop and grow to be effective within this construct. The fundamental nature, characteristics and operational considerations within both the air and space domains cannot be adequately covered by me at the moment in this presentation, but they are certainly covered in these manuals. I encourage you all to engage with them, to get involved in the constructive debates that will help us to continually improve them. These manuals are designed to give the readers the mindset that they, that they need to be creative and to encourage their curiosity, to best enable air-minded and space-minded practitioners to conceive and build the joint force contributions that we need to meet future challenges. The Air and Space Power Manual's highest aspiration is to expand thinking about the future possibilities of air and space power. Innovation comes from learning and from critical and creative thinking, from experimentation and from practice. These manuals are written to give the reader the widest possible aperture to figure out the what next. And this is the most important message within both manuals. The future of air and space power is you. This message is especially important for our large virtual audience, many of of, of whom uh, have long and influential careers in air and space power left in front of them. And I certainly expect a large number of our aviators at all levels to be tuned in. Uh, we all have an important role to play. Air and space power is realised through the ability of humans to use technology to unlock the latent advantages of these operational environments for any given purpose. It is this air and space mindedness which underpins the ability to integrate effectively with those less familiar with our profession, to act as leaders in these domains with good awareness and relationships where possible with others active within them. Alongside mastery in all other operational domains, professional mastery of air and space power are essential to crafting optimal joint force contributions that best support whole of government efforts to achieve our national objectives. It is in this spirit of collective efforts for unified purpose that I welcome my fellow domain leads to address the conference uh, and then to join me to discuss whatever issues you wish to raise. And I think I am going to start with the Chief of our Senior Service, the Royal Australian Navy, um, Vice Admiral Mike Noonan. Over to you, Gretchen. <laughs> 